thank you for being a guest here at calmclass.com. This website is dedicated to one thing, to be able to give you a different mindset. To be able to stay calm in tough times is by changing how you think, because when you change how you think, it changes how you live. My name is Dwight Bain. I'll be your host through most of these lessons, but I'm really glad that you found us. I'm really glad that you're taking time out to watch a lesson that will be life-changing. So do this. Take good notes. Download the study guides. Let these life application principles make your life a better place. And then would you let us know how this is helping you? My thanks to you for watching. My thanks to our incredible team for making it happen. But most of all, my thanks to God because he gives us principles that will change our life if we use them. Are you ready? Let's get started. Father, thank you for these friends and the opportunity to be able to talk about gardening. Gardening. Because when we step back, gardens are pretty important to you, God. And sometimes the weeds creep in, and so I pray that you'll use today's lesson to change hearts, but God, most of all, most of all, Father, use today's lesson to change mine, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, my wife knows how to use these. These are gardening tools. I don't know, can you see that, Jay, at calmclass.com? These are gardening tools. These are well-worn gardening tools. I say she knows how to use these because it is amazing. The woman can make anything grow. But I will tell you this, I don't really know anything about gardening, but I'm married to somebody who's really good at it in our yards and the plants on the back porch. and Everything looks great. But I can tell you that gardening is a lot of work. And the, num and the number one problem with gardening is that people try too much too soon. You see, everybody wants to grow, but they try to do too much too soon. And so what happens as they're gardening is that they get real frustrated and they give up. And I don't want that to happen because I want you to understand gardens are very important to God. When you look back, we were talking uh, at you know, calmclass.com, we were talking before the lesson about some of the things that Hollywood is doing and, and how certain films of a spiritual or biblical nature create really interesting conversations. But, but I want you to know, when you look back in the book of Genesis, where did it all start? The garden. When you look at the life of Christ, when you look at the life of Christ, where did his public ministry end? Oh, yeah, it was a garden called Gethsemane. It was a garden that you can still go to today, and there are olive trees that have been there, literally that would have been there when Jesus walked the earth. These, these olive trees have trunks this big around. They're thousands of years old. Because gardens are really important to God, and I want to share with you some things to be able to help you to be a better gardener in your own life and to make a bigger difference for the kingdom of God. When I think about this, if your life were a garden, and I think it is, how's it going? How's your garden going? There was a book that was very popular a few years ago, and if you haven't read it, it's a, an allegory, parable-type book. It was called The Shack, written by Paul Young. And if you haven't read it, it's really interesting because it'll, you know, we talked about starting and sparking conversations, and The Shack did that. It was not meant to be scripture. If you heard Paul Young when he came and spoke at Northland Church, Paul said, this wasn't supposed to be a Bible study. He said, I wrote this for my kids. The part that most people don't know when Paul Young wrote The Shack, because there's a whole chapter in there about the garden of the main character's life. The book is pretty much autobiographical because uh, the Holy Spirit comes along and, and shows him and takes him, literally takes him to this garden that is just run over with weeds. It is just all, I mean, it's all grown up. It's going to take, I mean, it's going to take weeks to get this garden in place. And he said, this garden is terrible. This garden is out of control. And the Holy Spirit, the character called Sarah Yu, says to the main character in the book, Mac, yeah, this garden is your life. And it's out of control, isn't it? It's wild. It's crazy. It's out of control. And you know what? This big old mess can be something glorious for God. I cried through that chapter because I thought, that's a lot of what I do. I help people with lots of broken pieces be able to remember, hey, let's just get started. This garden isn't dead, it's just growing in the wrong direction. And so with gardening, you pay attention to some things. 
So if your life were a garden, I think it is, how is your garden growing? How's your garden doing? Because we're looking in this series uh, that Pastor David and Pastor Jimmy have mapped out for us, we've been looking at being able to be a wise steward of the financial resources that God has given us. We looked at that the first week. And then to be a wise steward of reaching out into our community. Remember, Jesus taught Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then you reach the whole world. And we'll talk about that piece today. But being a good steward of the garden of your life, do you have a lot of weeds? I, I can tell you this because I'm married to an excellent gardener. It's, it's not just something you do once a year in spring cleaning. Now, tragically, unfortunately, the Lowe's company made a deal with my wife to try to kill me. They do this every year, Pat. They do it during spring break every year, and they take their, their red-colored cedar mulch, and they mark it down to 99 cents a bag. And, and the reason I know that my wife and Lowe's are trying to kill me is that for a dollar a bag, our van, I know, will hold 50 bags of this mulch. I'm not sure why we have to do it with 50 bags every year. I mean, I made the suggestion, why don't we take off a year? <laughs> I mean, we put in 50 bags last year and 50 bags the year before, but at least the mulch is easier when she really liked to use decorative rock and the dump truck would come and just dump a whole, you know, yards and yards of this, this decorative rock in the driveway. And then I was suggested to use a wheelbarrow and a shovel because it would be a form of exercise. I suggested that maybe we could find some teenagers who needed exercise more than me. So the Lowe's company and Sheila did not succeed in killing me. There are 50 bags of mulch and you know what? Yesterday, the big rainstorm, everything was exactly where it needed to be because it takes a lot of work to be a good gardener. So if your life were a garden, are you working your life? If your life was a garden, are you growing in your life? When I think about the garden of your life, and write it somewhere on your study guide, just put down garden of my life, dot, 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 how's it going? Garden of my life, how's it going? Because when I think about gardening, you know, our big focus today is in being able to to reach out to the world. Last night, <laughs> Sheila had an opportunity to go and uh, experience a concert over at Calvary Assembly Church with Casting Crowns and Laura Story and for King and Country. And the King and Country guys are great because they've got these, these like big you know, drums that you would see in a, a marching band. And, and they're really tall, they're from Australia, and they literally just like leap onto things and they're beating the drums because they're being bold for king and country. It was a great experience. But Casting Crowns, if you don't know the group, you certainly know Matt Hall, uh, or Mike Hall, who grew up in Daytona Beach as a youth pastor. And he took Bible studies for teenagers and he started setting them to music. And as he did that, uh, one of the kids in his youth group graduated from high school and went on to Stetson University where he met somebody who was close to the country band Sawyer Brown. This is uh, Sawyer Brown, this is going back 11 years ago. And, and, and these two students at Stetson started talking about this youth pastor who just wrote really creative songs. I'm gonna share one of the lyrics with you because he was just trying to teach teenagers Bible doctrine. And as I heard this, I thought, oh, this is exactly what we're teaching today. Because, uh, and, and you may have, uh, if you've heard the song, then you certainly can identify with the lyric, but it ties in perfectly to being able to say, what are, what are we doing to reach other people? I love what Pastor David said this morning in quoting John MacArthur, that the mission of the church is not to have a big worship celebration and praise fest. That's not the mission. The mission is to reach lost people. Listen to the lyric. This is from Mike Hall of Casting Crowns. Jesus, friend of sinners, Open our eyes to the world at the end of our pointing fingers. Let our hearts be led by mercy. Help us reach with open hearts and open doors. O oh, Jesus, friend of sinners, break our heart for what breaks yours. And the very last stanza says, I was the lost cause. I was the outcast. Yeah, you died for sinners just like me, a grateful leper at your feet. Oh, Jesus, friend of sinners, 
break our heart for what breaks yours. And I hope that you'll, you'll write that quote down and you'll meditate on it all week to be able to say which things motivated Jesus, which things broke the heart of Jesus. Because if you think about breaking the heart of Jesus, if it broke Jesus' heart, does it break your heart? There was a woman who was a pastor's daughter who changed America, and we don't talk about her enough. And I want to share with you a story that I'd, I'd sort of heard out at um, Epcot and the American Pavilion, but I'd forgotten because they didn't go into enough detail. Just listen. Her name was Hattie, and she was born into the most distinguished family of clergymen in America. Her father, Reverend Beecher, Lyman Beecher, was considered the greatest orator in America. That mantle was passed down to her brother, her brother, Henry Ward Beecher. But that's not who changed America. It was a pastor's daughter named Hattie. One Sunday morning, one Sunday morning in 1851, during the communion service at her church, Harriet fell into a trance, very similar to the trance that Peter had on the rooftop of Simon the Tanner's house. In her trance, Hattie saw an old slave being beaten to death. The vision left her so shaken, she could hardly keep from weeping, and she was still at church. She walked her children home from church. She skipped lunch. She immediately started writing down the vision that God gave her during Holy Communion. The words poured from her pen. When she ran out of paper, she found brown grocery bags and continued to write. When she stopped finally uh, writing and she read what she wrote, she could hardly believe that she had written it. It was nothing short of divine inspiration. Had he said that God wrote the book, she just put the words on paper. In January 1852, a year after Harriet Beecher Stowe's vision, the 45-chapter manuscript of a book called Uncle Tom's Cabin was ready for publication, the publisher, John P. Jewett, didn't think the book would sell many copies. And Pat, you know that, where publishers just have, you know, they, you know, they, 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 they love us, and then they have no vision. It's like, that's, that's never going to sell. So her publisher, it's not new, this is 1852. Her publisher says to Harriet, book's never going to sell. So the publisher prints 3,000 copies which is still kind of a standard print run today. Shows that, you know, how much publishing's changed, right? So the publisher says, we'll print 3,000 copies, and it was really a favor because her father and her brother were very influential clergymen. And he thought, well, maybe, maybe in the course of a few years we can sell 3,000 copies. Now listen to this. The book sold out the second day. The third and fourth printings were sold out before the book was even reviewed by the newspapers because no one could get a copy of it. The book that the publisher didn't think would sell many copies ended up in almost every house in America within a year, including the White House. No novel has had a greater effect on the conscience of a country than Harriet Beecher Stowe's vision that God gave her Uncle Tom's Cabin. In fact, when Hattie met President Lincoln, he said to her, so you're the little woman who started this great war. <laughs> She's taking Holy Communion. All right, let me say it just real plainly. She's from a wealthy, influential, Anglo-Caucasian family. She's taking Holy Communion in an all-white church, and during Communion, the Holy Spirit shakes her and gives her a vision because she was praying. My brother's important. My father's important. My husband's a hardworking man. I'm just a mom. No, it's not how God works. Break our heart, God, for what breaks yours. Slavery in the United States broke God's heart. And in 1851, during a communion service, a housewife said, God, I don't even know what's going on, but, but, but okay, God, I'll go home. And she wrote, and she wrote, and it changed a country. The challenge that we take from that that applies to our lesson is that she said, God, 
I want to serve you. Understand, she didn't live in the South. She was a housewife. But God so stirred up her heart for what stirs up God's heart. Let me help you with this. I know this may be offensive and shocking to some of you. God does not look like Gandalf, my favorite Lord of the Rings character. <laughs> an old white guy with a long beard with an attitude. That's not what God looks like. He let his son die for you because he loved you. Sing it with me. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Everything is beautiful. No, that's a different song. Tim, you, you could sing that. That's a different song, different era. Different era. Jesus loves the little children. And the purpose, when we think about being all in, that we're focusing on today is, who do you know that goes so outside their comfort zone, so outside of what they grew up as, I mean, a, 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 a Yankee Northern, by the way, Yankee, to those of you from the North, we Southerners say it with affection. <laughs> I mean, you won the war, we got NASCAR, it balances out. <laughs> You know, you got the great industrial cities of the north. We got Duck Dynasty and Redneck <laughs> Honey Boo Boo. Okay, so the southern tradition continues. Did I just say that, Pat? Did I say that out loud? <laughs> honey Boo Boo Child. <laughs> honey Boo Boo Child. <laughs> you, have Tommy better. you have taught me better. Yeah, and I, you know what? I didn't take the medicine this morning, and I knew if I would have, I could have stayed on focus. It shows, doesn't it? It shows. So when I was a student at Liberty University, I had never, because I'd gone to Bible college, I'd gone to community college, and uh, my parents taught me to be a lifelong learner. But in all of that learning, I'd never had an Asian professor. And I was so blessed to have several classes with Reverend, the Dr. Reverend Daniel Young Kim. And he had been a prisoner of war during the Korean conflict. He was a Presbyterian pastor. He was preaching and teaching, and they said, you need to evacuate this village, and you need to stop talking about God. You need to go low under the radar. Just don't say anything, and maybe you and your family will be okay. And he said, how can I not preach the gospel? This is my home. I will not leave. I will not stop teaching. And he was a prisoner of war, tortured, because of his faith in Christ, survived it. And, and when he would stand before our seminary classes, and he would pray, loving father, you knew it was his father. He had a relationship that was amazing. And, and through that, he left being a national Korean and felt God stirring in his heart to come to the United States to be able to teach those training for a lifetime of ministry how to have a heart for other cultures. He wasn't, he wasn't a first generation American. He was Korean, he has two passports. He got citizenship in the US because he said, and I had a chance to see him a few months ago, and he's very old and very feeble now, but he still has a heart. And when he talks to you, he's very reverent. Here's a man who was horribly tortured, but still has a heart, and reached out regularly to the men who were torturing him, the soldiers torturing him, to talk to them about Christ. Do you know somebody like that? Have you ever met somebody who had a heart for someone from another culture? Somebody from a different socioeconomic background? When you think about Someone who had the love of Jesus and it didn't matter their skin color and it didn't matter how much money they had and it didn't even matter what country they came from, what language that they used. When you think about someone, maybe you knew them or maybe you just read about them, who do you think of that has a heart like Jesus for the world? Who do you think of? Because of a wonderful suggestion given to me more than a month ago, I think we should stop and take a moment at your tables to Introduce yourself if you haven't already. And who do you think of when you think about someone, someone who has a heart for the world? Who comes to mind? 
Take a few minutes, get to know the people at your table, and let's see if we can come up with some names. Go. Billy Graham. Remember when we talked about gardening? The greatest mistake of gardeners is to underestimate how long, how long it takes to get the soil ready. You know, uh, Marty, when you're talking about going to homes, I do, when I go to historical homes, um, usually they have parts roped off that you can't touch, you can just watch. But the parts that are just like walls, you know, in these houses here in, the, in North America that are two, three hundred years old and something significant happened or someone significant, I'll reach over and just touch the wall or a staircase and just stop for a minute and close my eyes. And I'll say, God, let me feel what they felt. I did that at Fort McHenry where uh, you may remember the, the Star Spangled Banner was written from Baltimore Harbor. And Francis Scott Key saw Fort McHenry, which, which was being held by a bunch of, of, of storekeepers and bankers and farmers. And they weren't soldiers. They were just American citizens. And, and, and I was the last person to leave. And they said, sir, you need to leave. And I actually, because uh, it's a brick, simple building, and I got down on my knees and, and touched the wall and said, God, let me feel what they felt. When, when, when the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, and I just started weeping because God's spirit, if you ask, will let you experience things. And what happens is it will open your heart. Break my heart for what breaks yours, right? So when we think about reaching the world, the reason for this series that's all in is to say God has entrusted and put into our hands resources. Remember when we looked at the financial piece? We said that if you're loyal to this brand, according to Yahoo Money, and you get three a week, and you're a college student, you get three a week for the rest of your professional career, you will have spent $200,000 because we don't teach young people money management. We teach them consumerism. What? The latest, greatest computer whiz toy? We well, have to have it, but I just got you one last year. Oh, no, no, no. It's no good. Throw that one away. I need the new one. But, but there really is a God who really will hold us accountable for stewardship. Not just of our financial resources. And by the way, I see all the people hiding their Starbucks. I'm not trying to make you feel bad, okay? It's the idea of stewardship. Stewardship of our finances. When you're obedient to God, if he gave it all to you, of course you're going to be a good manager of it. And here's how it works. If you're a good farmer, very biblical principle. If you're a good farmer with a little farm, if you're a good gardener with a little bit, I mean, just, you know, it's just like a little planter in your window box, and you really start growing, you know what God does? He brings a harvest, and he says, let's make this a little bit bigger. I met this week. I was so excited because I knew that these folks had a large farm. They're from Canada, and, and, and I knew they had a large farm, and they do bold things for Christ. I was so happy to meet them. And they said, we have a large farm, and, and we do a lot of things. And I said, I've heard of your reputation. And, and, and the one fellow said, do you, do you know how big a large farm is in Canada? I said, I don't know, uh, you know, 10,000 acres, because I'd spoken in Iowa for some farmers, and, and some of those farms are 10 and even 20,000 acres. They said, Dwight, our, our family farm is 900 square miles Whoa. of working farm. Wow. I said, you know what? That's a farm. Medical marijuana. Is that bigger than Rhode Island? <laughs> yeah, that'd be much bigger than Rhode Island, and they do not grow medical marijuana. <laughs> that would be a cash crop, but no, no. But here's the exciting thing is that as they started with the little farm two generations ago, and they just, farming's hard work, gardening's hard work, but as they were faithful with that and they harvested, guess what happened? As they grew and as they gave to Christian service, the thing I love is meeting people that are extremely wealthy who believe in the 90% tithe. Because I love meeting them, and I love helping spread their cause because they go and give it away. God gives them. They harvest. They plant. They grow. They garden wisely and well. And God says, hey, good job. Let me grow your garden. But remember, that starts with tiny, tiny little steps. I took a picture of it on my phone, but, but the projector I, I don't know how to use to show you. But we have a crepe myrtle tree, and if you don't know what those are, they're very decorative. And years ago when we planted it, I mean, it got up to probably about 12 feet tall, and it's a flowering tree most of the year. It's very pretty. 
And because, you know, I'm married to this amazing gardener and everything's landscaped so pretty. And the neighbor said, you need to cut that back. And he had cut his back to like a stub. I said, well, you're going to kill it. He said, no, 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 Dwight. He said, you need to prune that so it'll grow. And I thought, listen, I, I read books because of my friend Pat Williams. I've even written a couple. I'm quoted by the New York Times, been on all the different networks. I know nothing about gardening, but with the confidence that comes with ignorance, I am pressed forward. And the next, the next year, I mean, he had cut his back, and the next year, his were blooming pretty, and ours weren't looking that good. And the lawn guy said, you know, you really ought to cut those back. And I said, no, seriously. They told me that last year. So anyway, come home one day, you know, after the first frost, it's cut down to a nub. And I was like, oh, my goodness gracious. Now, this is years ago. And the reason I tell you that story is because when I got out to get in the truck this morning, because it's cut down, I mean, it's about this big now. And it's just cut down, um, but, but you can almost watch the growth. And by the end of the summer, it'll be 20 feet tall. Because God, if you're a good gardener, and you know how to prune, and you know how to grow, and you're, and you're dedicated, and you're disciplined, and you do it every day, God will say, oh, you've been faithful with a little. Oh, watch this. I'm going to give you more. Now, see, it's never a problem for people, particularly in our culture, to say, I want more. The problem is they don't want to do the little and be faithful. I've had an opportunity the last few months to speak at some large churches around America about the changes in culture and the changes in religion. And I've seen some that are growing and thriving, standing room only, people packed in. You can't find a parking space three blocks from the building. And I've seen big buildings that are virtually empty. And the difference is in your study guide. If you look on page two, it asks the question, how did the church grow? This is from a book that David Platt wrote called Radical. He said, the church grew through self-denying, spirit-empowering disciples of Jesus, and they made other disciples of Jesus. Christians were not known for belonging to Christian churches. Instead, they were known for complete abandonment to Christ and his cause. And in your study, I just underline, underline that. That's what they were known for. They were not known for being religious. They were known for being real. There's your tweet for the day. Churches that grow are not known for being religious. They're known for being real. They're just real. They're not perfect people. They're not judgmental people. They're just real people with mistakes and problems who are just growing, and God worked through me so that we can reach some other people. They were known for complete abandonment to Christ and his cause, even in the face of untold trials and unthinkable persecution. And see, there's some thinker questions at the bottom of that page that says, is it possible for that to happen in the United States again? I can tell you that the research is very clear. The traditional gospel message, biblical Christianity, straight out of the Bible, is growing in every part of the world except North America and Western Europe. And everywhere else, it's growing faster than it ever has. I spoke at Campus Crusade for Christ on Friday, and at Crew, they were telling me how many tens of millions of people, new converts, are coming to know Christ everywhere around the developing world. Not happening in, in North America, not happening in Western Europe. But before we give up on North America and Western Europe, what would happen if during communion, a housewife, maybe a retiree, maybe somebody who's unemployed said, oh God, stir my heart. Couldn't we have another revival in this country? Do we have to give up just yet? Yeah, I know, because I was part of the moral majority and I worked for Jerry Falwell. Yeah, I know. Yeah, if we really, the church should just work on getting good, conservative, pro-family people in office. The problem is, we've tried that for 30 years, and some of them, when they get in office, kind of forgot who got them there. Have you noticed that? Most of them. Yeah, most of them, <laughs> Jay says. Amen, Jay. 
And it seems like if we make the goal getting the right political person in power, we forget that Jesus never did that. He said, pay your taxes and go reach broken people. And with 12 people, and one of them was a sellout, and one of them was a betrayer, and all but one ran away, and the one that didn't run away was a teenager. So, I mean, here are the, you know, here are the guys that he invested in. They had seen blind eyes open, deaf ears open, dead people got up. I mean, every funeral Jesus ever went to messed it up. I mean, my goodness. He goes into a funeral, and it's like, you know, dead people getting up. They had seen that. They had seen with their hard hearts. We don't have enough to feed these people. Five loaves, two fishes. And do you remember, did everybody get to eat that day, yes or no? Yes. Yes, there was stuff yes. left over. How many baskets were left over? Twelve. Twelve. How many disciples were there? Twelve. Twelve. So they're lugging these baskets full of food that they didn't have when they showed up. You know, fish and chips, right? So they're lugging these baskets down to the boat, and it's all they can do to carry them down there, and they're getting on the boat, and they're still complaining about how they don't have enough. When we complain, we're flipping God off. And you say, Dwight, that's strong language. Read your Bible. We're to be people who are known for gratitude and thankfulness, and when you live that way, you know what happens? Because if you live critical and you're always talking about the bad stuff and you're always, you're not drawing people to Christ. You're causing them to run away from whatever it is you believe. But if you live with gratitude and you're a good gardener, God will bring people into your life in amazing ways. And when we look at this, uh, Pastor David and Pastor Jimmy give us an outline. How to do it. Bottom of page three. Number one, talk about God. Talk about God. And talking about God is to start a conversation, to be able to start a spiritual conversation. Oh, yeah, and as part of that spiritual conversation, it's to speak about man's problem, which is sin. So to be able to talk about and not be shy and not be afraid, to be able to talk about, hey, you know what? All have sinned. It's in, it's in the study guide. It's in the study guide, not the book, right? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's why when Russell Crowe in the interviews about the Noah movie and so many of the interviewers, it was interesting because you can Google search this and see the little video clips. Uh, most of them are on YouTube or on uh, uh, Vimeo. And to be able to see many times, even with the cast of the movie talking about spirituality, the director of the movie talking about you know spirituality, the director of the movie said, we did not use Charlton Heston's voice as the voice of God because... God's bigger than any one man's voice, and we wanted to be reflective of how great God is. And I just wanted to cry. And it was on a new show. And I thought, here is Hollywood, not usually known for their depth of spirituality, saying people need to have spiritual conversations about God. Yes. Notice the second part is we bring in the element of, so how's your garden? What's growing? Is there sin in your life that needs to go away? And then number three is to speak the truth about Jesus. To speak the truth about Jesus. To be able to do that through our fellowship here in Orlando, we pray, we give, we go. I love what Mark Batterson, who's a pastor of a failed church in Chicago, he tried to start a church, it failed, felt like a failure, <coughs> got his ego all bruised up, humbled and broken, went on a trip with his family to Washington, D.C., where now he leads the largest church in the nation's capital. It's debt-free, and they do millions of dollars worth of outreach in inner-city Washington, D.C. to reach people for Christ because he failed. And listen to what he said. Listen to this. Quit living as if the purpose of your life is to arrive safely at your death. Set God-sized goals. Pursue God-ordained passions. Go after a dream that is destined to fail if you do not have divine intervention. Keep asking questions. Keep making mistakes. Keep seeking God. Stop pointing out problems and become part of the solution. Stop repeating the past and start creating the future. Stop playing it safe. Start taking some risks. Expand your horizons. Accumulate experiences. Enjoy the journey. Find every excuse you can to celebrate everything you can because God is good. When we do that, it draws people. 
Mark says, live like today is the first day of your life and the last day of your life. Don't let what's wrong with you keep you from worshiping what's right with God. Burn sinful bridges, blaze new trails. Don't let fear dictate your decisions. Take a flying leap of faith. Quit holding out. Quit holding back. Go all in with God and go all out for God. Mark Batterson from a book called All In, worth reading. But as I was thinking about gardening, Easter season's always special to me. My baby sister Trish was born on Easter Sunday. Easter's special to me because through a series of events that my dad orchestrated, in 1982, I had a chance to be part of a choir that sang at the Garden Tomb on Easter sunrise service morning in Jerusalem. It's, it was uh, my mom's cousin's church, and they needed some loud voices. I, I misinterpreted. Tim, I thought they meant, uh, you know, like, <clears throat> next American Idol voices. <laughs> well, uh, you know, do they? No, they just wanted loud voices because there wasn't, you know, back then the BBC was recording it live and, and there wasn't enough amplification. And I do have a loud voice, but they put me as far from the microphone as possible. I found out later it's because they didn't think I was any good as a singer. It shows what they know. You should hear me in the shower. No, no actually, you, you don't need that visual. So on the Garden Tomb, 1982, I was part of a choir that sang at sunrise in a yellow robe with a bunch of people that I didn't know from my cousin's church. And because we were taping for the BBC the afternoon before, uh, if you've ever been to Jerusalem, if you haven't, it's really, it's really worth going. It does make the Bible come alive. But the afternoon before, they shoot everybody out so that we could do a rehearsal for the television cameras and the radio people. And while they were setting everything up, I, I was supposed to be somewhere else helping, I know. But Pat, I slipped away, and I went to the garden tomb, the empty tomb. And I looked around, and I don't think you're supposed to do this. And I went inside, and I sat against the wall looking at where the body of Christ would have laid for about 20 minutes until somebody came and said, you're not supposed to be in here. <laughs> and I sat there, and I'd been fired from a job. That's why I had time to go. The only job in my life I've ever got fired from, and it was for um, speaking my mind about things I thought were stupid with management. And I learned that even though that Johnny Paycheck song, Take This Job, and, well, I love it, I think, was the lyric. <laughs> if you actually do that, you get fired, and you should get fired. You're not supposed to do that with your bosses. And so I was fired. And my daddy worked out a way for me to go on a trip that changed my life. And I sat and thought, I mean, I'm unemployed feeling like a failure. The next morning was Easter, and it was just a blur. We had to get up at 3 o'clock to get there. But I'll never forget sitting in a place that was a garden. still is. Gordon's Calvary. And sitting there and thinking, what am I going to do with my life? I always said I wanted to be a Christian counselor. And I said this girl that I was dating I wanted to get married to. And 30, what, five years later, I came back and put a ring on her finger and said, let's build a future, let's build a family. And I came back and went to Liberty University and said, teach me, teach me how to be a good gardener because I want to do something great for God. And you're part of that because I teach you how to garden so you can go teach others. That's what Calm Class is about. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these friends and thank you for gardens. And thank you for a chance to bring glory back to the one who is worthy. I sat in an empty tomb and I can say, he is risen. He is not here. But God, you taught me some things so I can teach my friends some things so they can go teach others. That's how you change the world. You pray for a broken heart during communion. You write down on the back of paper grocery sacks. And you learn and you garden a little bit. And you start a conversation about a mighty God. Help us to do that better because of our time in calm class and 
Help us to start living it here and now in Christ's holy name. Amen. Hi, Dwight Bain here, and I want to tell you about CalmClass.com. The website that you came to is actually a teaching lesson that we record in Orlando, Florida, every single week. You can actually come be part of the live audience. If you're in Florida, maybe you're visiting the Orlando area, come check us out. We meet at 3000 South John Young Parkway. It's on the campus of First Baptist Orlando, which is actually a pretty large place. So what you're looking for is a large building by a lake. It's a big three-story building called Faith Hall. And we're in Faith Hall, upstairs in room 301. But if you don't get a chance to come live to the presentation in Orlando, then if these lessons about making your life work better, to get past frustration in relationships, maybe frustrations on the job, maybe you're just kind of feeling beat up about what you believe. If you enjoy these lessons, would you do me a favor? Would you tell a friend? Because by your experience of telling other people, hey, this website helped me, these lessons helped me, when you're doing that, you're helping take the message that we teach in Orlando and to be able to spread that to the entire world. And thanks.